be a doctor, but he is really, really dumb. He has no excuse for any of the shenanigans going on here. Hello everyone, I truly hope that you are having a great day. My name is Emily and welcome to another episode of If the Slipper Fits. This is my series where I discuss just about any version of the Cinderella fairy tale that I can get my grubby little hands on. Full transparency, the original video idea that I had planned for this slot is, um, not working. So that has been shelved until further notice. And I had already put a lot of work into that one. So when trying to think of what to cover for a backup, I just wanted something simple. I wanted some junk food for the soul. And a made for TV romance movie is pretty much right on the money. So today we're taking a look at Prescription for Love, a Cinderella inspired movie that came out in 2019. I don't know how surprising of a fact this is, but I've actually actually seen this movie before. Listen, I was cat sitting. The owners allowed me to use their streaming services while I was there. I didn't want to be a weirdo and mess up their algorithm. I originally thought this was a Hallmark movie because this very much seems like their wheelhouse, but I couldn't find any textual evidence of Hallmark actually being involved, and they're usually not shy about that stuff. So I'm not entirely sure where this film originally popped up or if it was just meant for streaming from the start. But you're not interested in that. At. You're here to see A, how bad or surprisingly good this film is, and B, how it functions as an adaptation of Cinderella. So let's get right to it. As usual, I will give you a brief synopsis of the story just so that we're all on the same page for discussion, and then we will come back and actually discuss. At the start of the movie, we meet our protagonist Claire and her friend Serena. Claire is a nurse working at the local hospital, and Serena is a dancer who's also taking night classes to appease her parents. She makes a jab about Claire still keeping the plastic on her couch, then reminds her about her performance that night, which is a modern dance interpretation of Swan Lake. Claire's job is made more difficult by her supervisor, Lena, who is way more strict and demanding of her than one of the other other nurses, Whitney. But the head nurse position Lena is currently filling in for will soon be open for applicants. Throughout the film, we also see Claire working with a few different patients, including the ornery Mr. Samuelson, who's apparently been in and out of the hospital very frequently and is understandably frustrated, and Peyton, a teenager dealing with some complications after her appendectomy. Claire notices that Peyton is a dancer and talks about how she's going to see her friend dance that night. But because Lena demands that she do extra work even after her shifts ended, she arrives to the show late. And the elevator she gets in breaks down and stops, trapping Claire, a waiter, and another man inside. The waiter starts hyperventilating, apparently claustrophobic, but Claire calms him down. Then she and the other man pass the time by effectively making a skee-ball game with the shrimp from the catering cart and having some meaningful conversation. Claire reveals that her mother was very interested in the arts, but passed away a few years ago due to illness. The man explains his boss invited him to see the show and he wanted to make a good impression, but he also paints in his free time. Before the man can ask her on a proper date or get any practical information about her, the elevator is opened and he doesn't even get a good look at her face before they're both pulled away. But Claire recognizes his boss as her head doctor. The next day, the mystery man is introduced as Dr. Luke Taylor, who now works at the hospital. Claire tries to reintroduce herself, but at this point, he's a little fed up from the other nurses trying to hit on him, and he gives her the brush off. Claire worries she might have been making too much out of the encounter in the elevator and maybe pursuing him isn't worth it, but Serena suggests he might not have even recognized her. Claire fills out an application for a head nurse and her friend Stanley, who thinks she would be great for the job, drops it off at HR so she can't chicken out. Luke apologizes for being rude and explains about the unwanted flirtation, but he says that he's interested in someone else. Still, they manage to lead this conversation on better ground. 
Lena finds out that Claire applied for the job and not only keeps laying into her with extra work, but twists the truth to leave the doctors with a bad impression of her. However, Mrs. Godfrey, an older patient who is also a good donor to the hospital, is more than happy to sing Claire's praises, especially to Luke, and she instantly starts to play matchmaker for the two of them. But between Mrs. Godfrey and Jonathan, the hospital janitor whom Luke has started to befriend, he's inspired to at least try to track down the girl from the elevator. He goes back to the venue to see if he can glean anything from the list of ticket holders, but this obviously goes nowhere. After some more negging from Mrs. Godfrey, Luke agrees to take Claire out on a date on the condition that Mrs. Godfrey actually look at some treatment options for the tumor that she's been dealing with. So they go out for a cute lunch, but then Luke gets an idea to track down the catering company from that night on the chance the elevator girl was a waitress. Later on, Claire notices Luke sitting off by himself and lends an ear for him to talk about a previous case of his that still bothers him. Lena then drops the bombshell that Claire will be the one covering shift the night of the upcoming hospital fundraiser party, when virtually everyone else will be there. Claire invites Luke on a walk, and they end up finding a kiosk selling stuffed animals that also come with custom t-shirts. She says the turtle is her favorite, but ends up getting a penguin as a gift for Peyton. They talk more about the case he was remembering the other day, and he explains he still thinks about it because none of his co-workers spoke up to suggest an alternate plan, even though he could tell they wanted to. Luke tries to get some information out of the catering company and ends up telling Jonathan about the elevator girl. Claire notices a rash on Mr. Samuelson's leg, and she tries to explain to Luke that this, in addition to his other symptoms, might mean that he has lupus. But he gets a call back from the catering company at the same time, so he's a little short with her. He meets up with the waiter, who was also trapped in the elevator, but he doesn't have any information. He even brings up the possibility that she could already be taken, but remembered her saying that she got her ticket from one of the performers. Luke later goes over Mr. Samuelson's medical history and admits to Claire that her theory about lupus is sound, and he's going to bring it up with the head doctor. He then takes her to his painting studio and invites her to try it for herself. After they spend a little montage painting together, she points out one of his finished pieces that she likes, and they share a kiss. But he immediately regrets it, not only because they're co-workers, but he mentions again how he's interested in someone else. To which Claire points out that he seems to be interested in her as well. He talks it over with Jonathan, who explains that the elevator girl might not even live up to his expectations if he ever does find her, when he clearly already has a connection with someone else. Luke is reluctant to give up searching, but he doesn't want to hurt Claire. He then goes back to the venue to find the dancers rehearsing, and asks if any of them had guests opening night who got stuck in the elevator. He comes up empty, but Serena runs in late as he's already walking out. Mrs. Godfrey hopes that going to the fundraiser will be the final push Claire and Luke need to actually get together, but Claire explains that he likes someone else and she has to work that night. Thus, Mrs. Godfrey starts putting together a plan behind her back. She ropes Jonathan and Mr. Samuelson into helping her find a dress, convinces Peyton to donate a pair of her shoes, and gets Stanley to come in and cover Claire's shift. Claire is reluctant to go through with it at first, but Jonathan ends up being the one to convince her, unknowingly helping her realize that she is the other woman Luke's been talking about. She sneaks into the fundraiser to talk to Luke, but Lena notices her and interrupts before she can get to the point. She twists the whole situation to make it appear like Claire is not only shirking her responsibilities, but was only trying to get close to Luke because he had a say in who would get the head nurse position. Lena ends up firing her, and because Luke doesn't seem interested in hearing her side of the story, Claire runs straight home. Serena comes over, and the two of them get into an argument about Claire being too scared to take risks, but Serena's scared to admit to her parents she wants to dance professionally. The next day, Claire says goodbye to Peyton and cleans out her locker, then finally takes the plastic off of her couch. 
When Serena comes by again, she says that she's going to quit night school so she can focus on dance full time. Mrs. Godfrey basically tells Luke he's an idiot, and Mr. Samuelson actually lays into the head doctor, explaining that Claire was the one who ultimately figured out what was wrong with him because she actually cared enough to do so. After which, he begins to see Lena's true nature and reaches out to Claire with a job offer. As Peyton is leaving the hospital, Luke sees the show program she got from Claire Claire, and she helps him realize that the mystery woman was Claire all along. He tries to call her for a couple days, but when she ignores him, he mails her the painting that she liked, with instructions to meet at the stuffed animal kiosk. There, he presents her with the turtle she had pointed out with a big romantic speech. He apologizes for letting the other people at the hospital get in his head, and explains how he painted the piece she liked later after that night in the elevator. They reconcile and start dating. We see Claire return to the hospital as head nurse, with Lena having to do the hard work herself since being demoted. And that night, she and Luke plan to see Serena's last performance of Swan Lake. So first things first, the uh, pacing is not great, and this time I actually felt the slog as opposed to the German movie that I looked at last episode. It feels like every scene is like a scunch longer than it needs to be, like one or two lines maybe, but over the course of the film, it really adds up. And especially after the big climax at the fundraiser, I felt they could have shaved off at least three minutes. It also doesn't help that in addition to the main story, it's also trying to juggle like three or four different B plots with all of the side characters. And it does so in a very choppy way that only makes the A plot feel slower. I have no qualms with the acting at all. I think everybody was doing their best with what they were given, but I don't think that what they were given is terribly impressive. Some of this dialogue just doesn't feel realistic or natural. Again, the characters always say, like, a little bit more than they realistically need to, and I understand that at least in the beginning you've got to allow for at least a little bit of exposition because you've got to set up the world and the characters, but it doesn't really improve after that. I found it particularly odd they kept referring to it as the dance performance every time. Dance for the reception after the performance. Hey, how was the performance? A woman I met at the opening night performance. And it was at a, a dance performance or something. That is a lot of unnecessary syllables. Why not just the show or call it by its name and say Swan Lake? Like it's just little things like that, but constantly. As meh as the script is though, it actually does something really interesting structurally because the story has two sections that could be equated to a ball, but they serve vastly different purposes. The first is when they're trapped in the elevator, and this sets up the mystery romance. It's the equivalent of meeting the love interest in a candlelit ballroom or at a masquerade. And the majority of Luke's actions through the rest of the film are essentially a drawn-out slipper fitting among the kingdom, but there's no slipper. There actually isn't any identifier at all. I mean, unless you want to count being in a specific location. But this part also doesn't have a lot of the usual pressure on the Cinderella character. She's not somewhere anyone has prevented her from being. On the contrary, Serena invited her here. And even though their time together ends before they exchange names or anything, the time limit was not put in place from the start like it normally is. Then toward the end, of the film, the fundraiser has all of the expected buildup and complications from the original tale. The fact she's told she won't be able to go, the godmother orchestrating a way for her to go anyway, and providing her with a suitable outfit. But the purpose of going is much different. Claire knows who is going to be at this party, and she has a specific goal in mind. And also, unlike the fairy tale, things actually take a turn for the worse here. Lena displays just just how much control she has over Claire, and even Luke is influenced by her manipulation. No, maybe you should go. Luke, please. You're making a scene. This scene actually reminded me a lot of the ball in Ever After, which I know we haven't formally covered yet, but it was too similar not to mention. And once Claire leaves, Luke still technically has something to search for because he hasn't put two and two together that she's the same girl from the elevator, 
but more pressingly, he's left with this misbelief that he has to unlearn a handful of scenes later. I can't remember if I've seen another adaptation that spliced the ball like this and used it for both the meat cute and for the emotional climax of the story. And I think for that unique approach alone, this film deserves some points. And I think Claire herself is a very solid adaptation of the Cinderella character. Making her a nurse surprisingly touches on a lot of the same emotional themes from the original. She does incredibly hard work that sometimes isn't all that glamorous, but she's committed to being a good person even when there are others around her who don't and only care about increasing their social status. I love this moment in the epilogue where she offers Lena an extra set of scrubs after she's gotten dirty. Have a nice shift. Thank you. This is the absolute essence of Cinderella as a character boiled down to a five second interaction. Their roles are completely reversed and she could have easily made a comment about the shoe being on the other foot, but instead she chooses that high road and she shows Lena the same compassion that she would anyone else. I also really feel for her in this scene after the fundraiser where Serena just straight up victim blames her. Why didn't you stand up for yourself? I tried. Not hard enough. <laughs> Why are we not talking about how horrible Lena was to manipulate the situation and make her seem like an awful person in front of Luke? This whole scene is kind of frustrating, and I don't know if the metaphor they try to push with the plastic on the couch really works. The plastic is a protective measure, something to make her feel safe. Claire makes a comment later on about how taking off the plastic is the one thing she could change on her own, but I would argue the inverse would be just as true when she first decided to leave it on. There's a lot of her life that's ultimately left to the decisions of those with more power than her. But there's nothing in her relationship with Luke, or in her job for that matter, that really parallels to this. She wasn't hiding behind anything protective. If anything, Luke was the one trying to protect himself by holding on to this imaginary woman in his head and using that as an excuse for not entering into a real relationship. But she was nothing but honest with him the whole way. She was fully prepared to confess her feelings that night, and she got about 80% of the way there before Lena interfered. And even if she was a little nervous to turn it in, she did fill out the application for head nurse all on her own. She was fully prepared to take risks and make changes in her life if she wanted them. And ultimately, what saves her isn't standing up to the antagonist, but her connections with her patients and being a good nurse. She could have just rolled her eyes at Mr. Samuelson and been like, oh, okay, this is something unpleasant I gotta deal with, and just trudged through it. But she actively tried to help him like her and make their working relationship smoother. That's what helps her get her job back. And her wanting to connect with Peyton and be a friend when she was feeling lonely is what ends up saving her and Luke's relationship. Simply put, Claire is a great character and I will not hear a word spoken against her. I also think the adaptation of Luke from the original Prince works really well in a similar way. He's got a very high status position that a lot of people just see as a nice paycheck, but actually comes with a lot of influence over the well-being of other people. It seems kind of random at first to squash Cinderella and medical drama together, but when you break it down, it actually makes a surprising amount of sense. That said, I still have to file Luke away into the box of princes with very few brain cells. He may be a doctor, but he is really, really dumb. He has no excuse for any of the shenanigans going on here. Listen, even though he has a weirdly outdated phone for 2019 and being a doctor, that phone still has a flashlight, which he uses in the elevator once the lights go out. He makes a comment about seeing how long the battery lasts, but it's on the entire time they're stuck in there and it works fine. He easily could have seen Claire's face before they got out of there. But if you watch back carefully, you will realize that Luke never once 
looks at her that entire scene, and he doesn't even see her when he first gets in the elevator either. I don't know whether to think he's a psychopath for not at all feeling inclined to even glance at this person he's clearly forming an emotional connection with, or praise the director for being so thorough in making sure there was no way he would be able to recognize her later on. But he could have recognized her voice, though! He's also very easily influenced by what other people tell him, but also seems to be very stubborn and set in his own decisions. It just comes across as a little disjointed. As for the actual romance of this film, it gets the job done. I wasn't blown away by it. I wasn't screaming into a pillow. I think 90% of the reason it works is because you have two competent actors and a bunch of stock romance scenes thrown in a blender and slapped on a script. Which I realize could be said about most romance movies these days, but usually there will be one scene among the slush that really gets my butterflies going and makes me think like, man, me and who? but I didn't really get that here. On a more positive note, I am absolutely charmed by Mrs. Godfrey, who is obviously the fairy godmother character. She acts like Claire hung the moon. Besides, Luke told me that he's interested in someone else. What? Who could compete with you? She orchestrates getting her the makeover for the fundraiser, plus the name Godfrey, Godfairy, fairy godmother? Y'all thought you were so clever with that one. I see your little games. She is just delightful. You can tell the actress had a lot of fun with the role, and she perfectly balances earnestness and nibbling on the scenery when the moment calls for it. Plus, she gets all the best lines. Come back when you're done. Well, that was deliciously awkward. That clip is immediately going into my editing toolbox. I will make this a thing if it kills me. <laughs> now, they make a very obvious point when we're first introduced to her that her tumor is affecting her memory to some degree. I was just so enthralled with my book. I just love Jane Eyre. You know that Mr. Rochester, he just- Isn't that Moby Dick? <laughs> But for the rest of her time in the film, she is sharp as a tack. It never comes up again. Come on, don't you want to see him? Who? Dr. Taylor, keep up. Even for a film set in a hospital, it's very easy to digest, and it doesn't delve too deeply into anybody's medical issues because that's not really the point of the story. So I understand not wanting to deal too much with the effects of dementia on a person, but if that's the case, then why even make the point about it in the first place? You could have just cut this entire joke and the rest of the movie would still make perfect sense. Oh, did I mention that I actually recognize one of the actors in this film? When I first watched it, I immediately clocked Lena's actress, Carla Bocciccio, as the one who played Mrs. Allen in the Kate Moreland Chronicles, which is a web series adaptation of Northanger Abbey, and it's adorable, and everyone should go watch it. I am more than your boss, dear. I've known you since you were in diapers. I think that qualifies me to get involved in your love life. Your mother would agree. Actually, we talked about it on the phone last night. Of course you did. Like everyone else here, I think she did the best with what she was given. And I also appreciate that she went for a more cunning approach rather than just evil for evil's sake. But since she was the only actor I recognized, it did suck that she wasn't playing someone that I could root for, or at least a friendlier character, but that's completely a me issue. Hey, look at the clock! It's time for the obligatory fashion critique. And this one is a little more unorthodox, because instead of a magical gift designed to make her stand out, this is the result of Claire's friends finding whatever is available that will work. This dress is literally from the hospital's Lost and Found, so in that way, it's not really supposed to be outstanding or somehow perfect for Claire specifically. And with those more realistic expectations in place, I think this dress hits the nail on the head. Although it does make me wonder about who owned this dress before and why they were at the hospital when they lost it. The sequins help elevate it for a more formal occasion, and the overlapping floral designs give it interest, but it's still not 
great. I am really not a fan of this color. I think it washes her out, though it does look better once she actually gets to the fundraiser. This lighting in the hospital hallway couldn't do her a favor if she paid for one. The silhouette is also pretty basic. It's just an A-line skirt, although it is similar to her dress in the elevator, so maybe that was intentional. And I am not into these shoes either. I think something about the wedges just makes the whole outfit look cheap. But again, because of the story, the point of the outfit is to be pretty, but not necessarily perfect. So even if I don't necessarily like the look, I do respect it for its thematic purpose. It's probably been easy to tell with how I've been going on, but when it comes to this film as a whole, it is very middle of the road for me. Honestly, more so than I first thought, because there are some interesting things being done here. I like that the filmmakers wanted to go for an adaptation that focused more on the emotional themes of the original, rather than just recreating famous scenes in modern context, because Lord knows that's already been done. But then you come back to more foundational issues like the sloggy pacing and the dialogue, and they put it right back in this position where it's very okay, but it will not change your life. But honestly, that's already more than I initially expected. And with that, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. I really hope that you enjoyed it. You can show your support for this video by giving it a like and if you're interested in seeing more from this series where I talk about various Cinderella-related media, there will be links to the playlist, and you can also subscribe to see future episodes. Please know that everyone who's already shown support for this series just has my entire heart. Thank you so much. And be sure to leave a comment if there's something specific you'd like to see me talk about. But for now, I think I'm about to turn into a pumpkin, so I will see you next time. Bye. Mwah, 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 mwah. <laughs>